The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may eat freely of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some of it to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. The word of the Lord. So what better time to go back to the beginning than on the first Sunday of Lent? I was not really surprised to see this reading as one of our lectionary readings today. Lent is a season of repentance which we often associate with sin, and we're all very familiar with this passage. We know it has long influenced Christian belief about our fall from grace and our condition of original sin. Thank you, Augustine. <laughs> now, recognizing our original condition during a season of self-examination can, I guess, help us turn back toward God for direction and for purpose. Beginnings do set the stage for the rest of our stories. They can help us determine just where and how we got off track. That being said, you may have intuited that this is not one of my favorite readings. It's really not the reading itself. I don't have a problem with the story at all. It's just that it carries so much baggage. I mean, who is responsible for sin? I mean, is it Eve? Is it Adam who stood by silently? Is it the serpent who did the tempting? Or is it God? Is sin something that really is original, something that we pass down one to another? Or is this merely a just-so story written to explain why death exists in the world? Or why we have so many choices to make as we mature and have to leave our parents' homes? Or does it explain why there's separation in the world? Or why we have to work so hard with the land to have food to eat and shelter? Or why we have pain in childbirth? Does it prescribe gender roles? Or does it help explain why so many people are afraid of snakes? <laughs> My animals don't talk anymore. We have imposed so many of our own distractions and our own insecurities on this text that sometimes I feel like we really have lost our way. Temptations lurk in the background 
of just about every twist and turn of our understanding of this passage. Each time we read this story, it seems as though we are tempted to use it to hold others or ourselves down or back, perhaps in a way making a potentially life-giving story into one that carries only dead weight. Perhaps we use it to turn our bread, something that could feed us, into stones. But there are other times when we read this story, and I think that we are tempted to look down at, we, at what we perceive to be the pinnacle of God's good creation, humankind, making our bodies our very own temples. And then we use this story as a license to do whatever it is we will each time getting bolder and bolder as we ask God to save us from the messes that we create. And then, I think there are times when we read this story and it takes us to much deeper places of temptation. Places where we look out at all of the land and everything that has been created and all we see is possibilities for ourselves as we crown ourselves kings and queens and build kingdoms, draw boundaries, separate peoples, and decide worth. We begin to worship and serve our very own desires, legitimizing them, of course, with the idea that we are the ones who possess the knowledge. So, of course, we know what is right. Now these are just some of the reasons that I asked you to clear your thoughts this morning before we read the text. To try and hear the reading as if you were hearing it for the very first time without preconceived notions about what this might be about. Because when we listen, when we really listen to this story, then we can hear that there is no mention of the word sin in this story. There is no mention of any of the synonyms of sin in this story. There is no mention of a fall or the fall. If we go back to the beginning and we read this story on purpose, then I believe we can hear some very different things, some new things. Sometimes a light surprises. And the very first line of our reading this morning is on purpose. Listen. The Lord God took the man, the Adam, from the Hebrew word Adamah. The Lord God took the man from the ground. The Lord God took the groundling and put him into the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. Now beginnings often give us two things, location and purpose. And this does both. From the beginning, humankind was created for a purpose, for a place to till and keep creation. Or more literally, in Hebrew, to serve and to preserve the garden. To serve and preserve the ground, to be a slave to and protector of all that God has created. The groundling belongs to and depends upon the ground. And the fruitfulness of the ground depends upon the groundling. This statement of purpose informs our understanding of everything else that happens in Eden. Now, you may think that this statement of purpose is no big deal, but I think it's huge. 
Having purpose is one of the things that separated the Israelite religion from other ancient traditions of the time. John L. Berquist, president of Disciples Seminary Foundation in Claremont, California, says it this way. So many other creation stories of the ancient world depict the creation of humanity as a byproduct as an accident, or even as a mistake of the gods. But what Genesis makes clear here is that God intended, intended to create humanity, not on a whim, not as an accident, not for God's own entertainment, but for a purpose, for a place. And because of this, then, humanity was created with this inherent dignity in it. We were designed and fashioned because God had in mind something for us to do, something for us to be, somewhere for us to belong. And knowing this, it can help change our entire perspective in terms of our relationship with God, our relationships with each other, and our relationship to creation itself. Knowing that we are not created for ourselves can help us better imagine the limits of our bodies. We were not created to be singular, separate entities. Rather, we were created with the intention that we would be formed and sustained by our fundamental interdependence with all living things in God's good creation. Now, our recognition of this one truth of our existence has radical implications for our living. When we recognize that we are indeed created for this purpose, for interdependence, then we can begin to to see and to shift our thinking from lack to one of abundance, to see just how many good things we have been given by God. I mean, our focus shifts from from being obsessed with what comes out of us, what we can make of ourselves, how we can use creation to an awareness of how everything comes to us. Our starting point itself becomes one of giftedness. Everything in creation has been given by God as an unmerited treasure. That's a heck of a beginning, don't you think? God intends for humankind to serve and to protect all that has been given so that every living thing that God has created can prosper and flourish. This is why we were created. And when we care for creation, we're doing the work that God intends for us to do. It's God's good intention for us to live on purpose. According to distinguished theologian in residence at Vancouver School of Theology, Sally McFaig, when we pause long enough to realize that we are the gifted, we are the given, the needy, we are the receivers, we are the ones who must be fed minute by minute, day by day, year by year, by the world, by what God provides, then, then we can realize that our primary role is to participate in giving back to the world 
Whatever assets, whatever talents, whatever gifts, whatever money, whatever influence and so on that we accumulate during our brief sojourn here on earth for the betterment of the whole, for the betterment of creation. Our place and our purpose is to serve and preserve all that God has given. Can you imagine what the world would be like if we took that purpose seriously? What it would look like in our personal, in our professional, in our public lives with each other. See, caring for creation, it's not a hobby. It's not a habit that we need to develop. It's not a strategy to make us feel better about ourselves. It is our purpose. So on this, the first Sunday of Lent, it's good to let God lead us back to the Genesis, to the moments when humankind was created so we can hear new things in this age-old story, new things that can indeed give us so much life. Feed us, in fact, right from the Word of God. Words that allow us, empower us to take responsibility for our actions rather than constantly put God to the test asking, always for saving acts for the destruction that we wreak? Words that take us back to the beginning, to the time and place where God speaks and we learn how to worship and serve God by living on purpose. Amen.